I'm David Adams, and I want you to come with me on an epic journey. I'm fascinated by the rise of empires and the bitter, bloody, dynastic struggles that tore them apart. Timur, the sword of Islam. Edgar, king of all the English. Attila the Hun. And Charlemagne, the father of Europe. All built vast empires that dominated our world before they fell. Destroyed from within by vicious family infighting. In the 14th century, a Central Asian warrior king fights a holy war on a distant continent. And they fired flaming arrows into the caves and they smoke the Georgians out. And comes face to face with a battlefield monster. A truly terrifying weapon awaits them. 125 war elephants before a family conflict erupts throughout the realm. This 200,000 strong army disperses, never to be united again. The final outcome is bloodshed, betrayal, and the end of empire. I'm David Adams, and I'm in the Hisor Mountains, southeast Uzbekistan. And this is the homeland of one of the world's greatest conquerors. But I'm not talking about Genghis Khan. 200 years after Genghis, a local warlord here would create an empire that would astound the world. This is Timur, AKA Tamerlane. He's got a lot in common with Genghis Khan. He's 50% Mongol, 50% Turk, and 100% ruthless. Over 35 years, he and his army leave 17 million dead in their wake. Roughly 5% of the world's population at the time. In the last half of the 14th century, Timur carves out a massive empire from India to the shores of the Mediterranean. It's all about creating a dynasty, an imperial bloodline that will endure through the generations. Timur needs an heir to secure his empire. He puts his hopes in a number of sons and grandsons, but few live up to the expectations of the warrior king. And one by one, they fall by the wayside. But less than a hundred years after Timur's death, his empire lies in ruins. Now to find out how it all went so wrong, I need to get back to where it all began. I've met up with Rustam Nazarov, my guide into the world that Timur grew up in. First stop is a Bushkazi game, which began as a celebration of victory in battle. This is very ancient game, yeah. and this is very famous in Central Asia. Players compete for a goat or calf carcass, which they must wrestle from the melee and drag to a goal line. In days gone by, the body of a defeated chieftain was used instead. This is Faizula. He's the Central Asian Bushkazi champion. Like Timur, he's from the Balas clan, and he bears the scars of many years competing in this brutal sport. Oh, 
Well, Bushkazi is about the oldest game you can play. Timor's troops would have used it between their battles to actually train. Believe it or not, this is what a Sunday afternoon, fun day out is like in Uzbekistan. It's a, one of the most amazing games in the world, and I can't not have a go. These men ride with the spirit of their warrior ancestors. Mounted soldiers with a bow in one hand and a sabre in the other. Fearsome fighters who left carnage on the battlefield. And only the most formidable man could lead them. That man was Amir Timur, known in the West as Tamerlane the Great. To understand the environment that shaped Timur and his soldiers, Rustam is taking me to a nearby mountain village. So you think a lot of Timur's army would have come from here? Yeah, because Timur picked his soldiers from mountain area because he knew that these area people are very healthy and men are very brave and tall. Uh, yeah. We're in the heartland of what's been known since Roman times as Trans-Oxiana. Throughout history, this region of Central Asia has been conquered time and time again. Beautiful village. Yeah. This is very ancient village, very old village. It's yeah. very unusual. Yeah. You see, still they have such a traditional way of arch. So is this the sort of village that Timor would have grown up in? Definitely, it was grown up in such a tough life. Around the mid-1330s, a boy who would grow up to conquer almost half the known world is born into humble surroundings like this, in what is today Uzbekistan. The ritual of salting a baby to ward off evil goes back to well before Timur's time. According to local legend, at his birth, Timur's hands are covered in blood. An omen foretelling the millions who would die in the wake of his relentless quest for power. This is where young Timur masters riding and hunting, where he learns to fight and plunder, holding up travelers and battling rival tribes. It's a hard life, and Timur is tougher and wilier than most. He'll take with him many lessons learnt growing up in a remote community. When he was looking to attack a village or a town, he'd send in two people and they'd check out whether it was a communal oven or whether it was ovens in each house. If it was a communal oven, he reckoned that the village would be more united. If only the houses had ovens, he thought it would be easier to attack. Timur's people are a mix of Tatars and Islamic Turks. But Timur doesn't have a royal bloodline, and that threatens his chances of holding on to power or passing it to an heir. Timur has high hopes for his first son and names him Jahangir, meaning conqueror of the world. He's the first of four boys born to four different wives. Because of their lowly background, Timur and his sons won't inherit power, they'll have to seize it. Timur is cunning. He's a member of the Balas clan, but when the Mongol army invades, his chief flees. And so Timur installs himself as the head of the clan. And he's just 24 years old. Uzbek hospitality is legendary, and as the new leader, Timur welcomes the Mongols to his homeland, shrewdly aligning himself with the invaders. He's still revered by these villagers, 
remembered for his bravery, cunning, and a love of art and science. Timur definitely, he was like a, a, a great like a, a scientist, he's a great scholar. But Timur is also ruthless in the pursuit of power. Soon he starts plotting against his Mongol allies. They're daunting foes, too powerful to take on alone. Timur forms an alliance with a fellow tribal leader, Amir Hussein. Together they drive the Mongol invaders out of their homeland, Transoxiana. And by 1370, they've carved out the beginnings of a new empire. But empire building is a brutal game. And Timur proves again that he's a master of betrayal. Just months after their shared victory, Timur lays siege to his ally's capital, seizes his treasure, takes over his army and executes him. Timur sees himself as both a defender of the Islamic faith and a world conqueror in the Mongol tradition, striving to restore the grandeur of Genghis Khan's former empire. Timur is now the undisputed ruler of Transoxiania, and this is the great turning point in his life. The conqueror and the empire builder become one. Here in ancient Kesh, his lifelong obsession with architecture and building begins. This is what remains of the gate of his palace, the Aksarai. What he would create here would astound the world. In 14th century, Timur begins his unstoppable rise from unknown tribal leader to feared warrior king, with an empire stretching throughout Central Asia. A ruthless military general, he wipes out anyone standing in his way. And in the pursuit of power, he lays waste to great cities while building others. I've come to the city of Shari Sabz in Uzbekistan, where Timur oversees the construction of a glorious summer palace, the Ark Sarai. Well, this place is really just one giant archaeological site. Right here, there's part of the floor. We'll push this back, get a bit of water on it. You'll see these beautiful tiles. In Timor's time, they cover the floors and walls of the buildings around me, a glittering symbol of his ambitions. Above one archway, an inscription reads, let he who doubts our power look upon our buildings. It's all part of a drive to secure his legacy. But most of all, Timor wants to build a dynasty. Timur now turns his attention to greater conquest. And at the head of his devastating mounted army, they march northwest to Muslim Khorizam. They take the fabled city of Kat. In the streets, the men are butchered and the women and children are taken into slavery. And as part of the spoils, he takes a princess called Khan Zada. She's a direct descendant of Genghis Khan and possesses the bloodline Timur desperately needs for his dynasty. He forces her to marry his oldest son, Jahangir, giving Timur's family a newfound legitimacy. And as he plots his family's future, he starts building a capital worthy of a great empire. Timur 
Timor chooses Samarkand as his capital. Located on the lucrative Silk Road trade route at the crossroads of East and West, it has great strategic and financial importance. Timor had a grand plan. He wanted to transform his homeland. And from his conquered lands, he brought artisans, masons and architects. And here in Samarkand, he began to reimagine an imperial capital. It would become known as the Pearl of the East. And today, there's nowhere else that gives us an indication of the grandeur of his reign than this place, the Registan, the place of sand. For me, this is the most amazing square in the world. Control of trade routes and the spoils of conquests finance these projects. And Timur makes sure that his people share in his success. His army are well rewarded, guaranteeing their loyalty. And for his capital's inhabitants, life is good. Rachmat, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, nothing's really changed here in 600 years. These markets are as rich as they were in Timor's time. And these produce comes from all over the world. Timor transforms Samarkand. Like Rome, Athens and Babylon, it becomes one of the truly great ancient cities. By 1376, everything's going right for Timor. His power, his renown, his army are all growing at the pace of his empire. Samarkand, his glorious capital, is the most spectacular and wealthiest center on the Silk Road. His beloved son, Jahangir, is 20 years old and now a most capable general. And what's more, he's married into Genghis Khan's bloodline. But then, while on campaign in the eastern frontiers, Timur gets terrible news. He rushes back to the capital to find a city in mourning. Jahangir, Timur's eldest son, the great hope for his dynasty, is dead, struck down by illness. This massive plane tree is more than 600 years old. It's said that Timur planted it when he laid his son Jahangir to rest. That's his mausoleum over there. As he mourned, Timur had a momentous decision to make. Which of his sons and grandsons would inherit the empire? Timur is determined to transform his family into respected royalty. Jahangir's widow, Kanzada, and her royal Mongol heritage are vital to his plans. Timur has her marry Mirinshah, his third son, hoping that the couple will produce blue-blooded heirs to the empire. Timur now looks west to the infidel lands of Christian Georgia to expand his empire. Nestled in the Caucasus Mountains, the Georgians have long endured invasion. But this time, Timur and his war machine are intent on far more than conquest. As the sword of God, Timur is about to unleash jihad. Timur marches west to the borders of Europe. His ambitions now lie beyond his own continent. Well, I've come to Tbilisi, the site of so much fighting over so many years. Timur really had a bee in his bonnet about the Georgians, and he never gave up. But then again, neither did the Georgians. Timur swept in here from the south and besieged the city. He invaded this place eight times. It's just incredible how the Georgians survived. Even today, in the heart of the capital, 
this bitter clash of civilizations has not been forgotten. In the name of Islam, Timur destroys churches, monasteries, and forts. He burns crops and vines to starve the people and wipe them and their beliefs from the face of the earth. But the Georgians never give up and do what they can to continue their way of life. When Timur Leng came, the first thing they destroyed was vineyards. For us, wine and vineyard is uh, holy, you know. Mm. So Georgian warriors, what they did, they would cut the seedlings and they hid under their chest. So, and they would go and collect the dead Georgian bodies. So every, all the Georgians knew that there were wine seedlings hidden under their warrior outfit. Uh. So they took it out. They made more seedlings, and, and then a few years after, when the uh, Muslim invaders <laughs> came back again, they still saw these beautiful Georgian you know, vineyards here yeah. everywhere, and they were shocked. They did not know how it was possible, because they did not know this secret. Temur Leng is cinema where we are this. Salary, you know. And they don't just survive, they fight back too, waging a guerrilla war from the saddle. They're exceptional riders, and today, mountain horse races remain a national pastime. I'm in the hills of Kaheti in western Georgia. Timur came through here and laid waste to this place, but he didn't do it without a fight. These guys are the descendants of those valiant warriors that actually fought Timor. And as you'll see, they're just about as good a horseman as those guys were as well. <laughs> Against Timor, the Georgians used their horsemanship and knowledge of the local terrain to harass his men and lead them into ambushes. Well, I didn't even finish, uh, but I think I would have been stone motherless last. It just shows you the skill of these guys. Someone like me who rides a bit, I really can't compete. In 1395, Timur's new favoured heir, his third son Mirinshah, suffers an embarrassing defeat at the hands of the Georgians. While laying siege to a fortress, he's ambushed and forced to retreat. Timur returns to the region and teaches his prospective successor an important lesson. No defeat should go unavenged. He corners the Georgian army in the west of the country. Here in Vadzia, the Georgians secreted themselves into these cave systems. It's an amazing place. It goes all the way along the mountain. But Timur had yet another trick up his sleeve. He lowered men down in baskets and they fired flaming arrows into the caves that smoked the Georgians out. When they came to the edge, his men picked them off with arrows and they fell to their deaths. After Georgia, Timur casts his conquering eye towards Persia, today's Iran. In 1387, he arrives outside Isfahan. Now, the city immediately surrenders and submits itself to his mercy. But the infiltrators break the deal by killing some of Timur's men inside the city. Timur's vengeance is merciless. He shows the world what happens when you cross him. There's more betrayal on the road ahead. As Timur makes his way back to his homeland, he receives news that Toktamish, his ally and direct descendant of Genghis Khan, has struck deep into Timur's own empire. In a strategic move, Toktamish now threatens Bukhara. Known as the city of merchants, Timur relies on it to finance his empire. Timur is incensed that his former friend would now betray him. 
the attack on Transoxania, and particularly the region of Bohara, was an attack on his heartland as his yeah. rightful domain. And therefore, Timur felt obliged to react. Uh, Archaeologist Baruz Kabanov believes Tokhtamish's royal heritage lay behind the attack. Tokhtamish perceived himself as a rightful successor of Genghis Khan, and therefore he felt justified to uh, conquer the territories ruled by Timur. Timur had tried to marry his family into Genghis Khan's royal bloodline and become the man to follow in the Khan's footsteps. Now Tokhtamish threatened that dream, as well as one of his most important cities. This was a massive trade capital and center for Islamic culture and theology. This was the heart of the Silk Road and its riches. Losing it would be a disaster. Timur marches his army back to his homeland, Transoxiana. But Tokhtamish doesn't stand his ground, leaving the prized possession of Bukhara behind as he retreats. It's not enough for Timur. He wants to end the ambitions of his rival for good. He plans a campaign involving two potential heirs, his third son, Mirin Shah, and grandson, Muhammad Sultan. Timur is about to take them and a 200,000 strong army on his most dangerous mission yet. Great empires often fall in the wake of bitter family power struggles. In the 14th century, Timur the warrior king carves out a great Central Asian empire, but he's attacked by a former ally, the tribal leader Tokhtamish. A revengeful Timur plans a surprise winter attack across the harsh Eurasian steppe into modern-day Russia. Two of his generals are potential heirs to the empire, his son Mirin Shah and grandson Muhammad Sultan. They're about to get the chance to prove their leadership skills on a grueling 3,000 kilometer trek across frozen steppe lands. Timur's forces engaged Tokhtamish at the Battle of Kondurcha in today's Russia. Timur's grandson, Muhammad Sultan, leads the attack and shows he's just as devastating in battle as his fearsome grandfather. On the right flank, Mirin Shah also proves a decisive leader. They overwhelm Tokhtamish's forces. 100,000 men are left dead and dying in the snow. Timur's revenge is complete. Two possible heirs have proved themselves, but replacing Timur remains a distant prospect. He's showing no signs of slowing down, and at a time when life expectancy is just over Timur in his 50s, is outlasting some of the candidates to succeed him. By 1398, Timur's empire extends from modern-day Kazakhstan in the north to Afghanistan in the south and across Iran and Iraq to the borders of Turkey in the west. Still not satisfied, Timur sets his sights even further afield, eastwards towards India. Timur hears that civil war has pushed the north of the country to breaking point. The capital, Delhi, renowned for its incredible wealth, is there for the taking. On this campaign, Timur brings two further heirs, his grandsons Pir Muhammad and Khalil Sultan. At the head of a 90,000 strong army, Timur and his grandsons invade India. Now, as the crow flies, Delhi's around 1,600 kilometers to the southeast of Samarkand. Now, Timur and his army cross over the Hindu Kush, one of the most treacherous mountain ranges on Earth. 
They then sweep down into the Punjab and out onto the Indian plain. But when they reach Delhi, a truly terrifying weapon awaits them. 125 war elephants. Since the time of Alexander the Great, these have been the battle tanks of India's armies. The Indians unleash the elephants, and behind them, 50,000 troops come swarming down out of the city and across the plain to engage Timur's army. But Timur is ready for them. He sends hundreds of camels with blazing bales of hay tied to their backs towards the enemy. Elephants are brought down. Others turn in panic and trample the Indian troops. It's the moment for Timur's grandsons to prove themselves. Pir Muhammad charges the Indian troops and forces a retreat. Out on the left flank, Prince Khalil battles bravely too. He even manages to capture one of the war elephants. Its two cousins try to show their grandfather that they have what it takes to rule. In the end, the Indians are defeated and the gates to Delhi lie open. Timur stations his army at the House Kaz, Delhi's water reservoir, ready to accept the city's surrender. But shortly after his arrival, Hindu insurgents attack his soldiers. Timur takes revenge on the people of Delhi. Slaughtering people, slaughtering villages. Historian Dr. Rakshanda Jalil has studied Timur's own account of the massacre that followed. And she believes it was really motivated by riches. I think for all his great sort of theorizing and for his invoking of killing the infidels and how it is perfectly permissible uh, according to his religion, to my mind seems like a very clever camouflage, you know, of a way of uh, covering his whole argument, which is essentially uh, a loot and plunder. In just one day, a hundred thousand people are killed and the city is destroyed. Timur calls it his greatest conquest. He arrives back in Samarkand with thousands of slaves, treasure and even war elephants. Among his prisoners are artisans, architects and stonemasons. Timur puts them to work, constructing a fitting tribute to the god who granted him his victory. A mosque on a scale never seen before. Timur is obsessed by the building. He draws his inspiration from the Quran, designing the building to appear like it would touch the stars. The Bibi Hanum Mosque reinforces his claim as a champion of Islam. Its grand architectural style will inspire the Kremlin and the Taj Mahal. However, more earthly matters are also on the great ruler's mind. There's trouble in the west of his empire, in Persia. Timur is forced to put aside his building projects and gather his troops. This time, not for conquest, but to deal with a wayward son. Timur's third son, an heir apparent, Mirinshah, is unfit to rule. Mirinshah has been thrown off his horse and hit his head, and he's acting in a really deranged way. In his Persian kingdom, he orders beautiful buildings to be pulled down, and he takes up a life of crazed debauchery. When Timur finally arrives, he removes his son from the governorship. Mirinshah is now out of the succession planning. Timur turns to his eldest grandson, Muhammad Sultan, 
and chooses him to lead a military operation into modern-day Turkey. He's key in delivering victory to Timur, but it comes at a great cost. Mohammed Sultan is wounded in battle. Timur rushes to his camp to be by his bedside, but after three days, Mohammed Sultan, the heir apparent, dies. In keeping with Mongol custom, Muhammad Sultan's war drum is destroyed, and the issue of succession looms large for Timur once more. He's now in his late 60s and running out of time to find the right man to take his place. He wants someone with unique leadership skills, and none of his surviving offspring seem to measure up. One grandson, though, is at least battle-hardened. Pir Muhammad had impressed Timur during the India campaign, even capturing a war elephant for him. Now Timur names him heir to the empire. But then Timur compromises. He carves up territories for each of his sons and grandsons. A strategy, perhaps, to keep the family peace after his death. For now, at least, the foundation for the succession is in place. And in the city of Kesh, the final brick is laid in one of his grandest construction projects, the Aksarai Palace. The palace was finally completed in 1404. And to celebrate, Timur invited 40 kings and heads of state to attend. The problem was the Chinese emperor refused to come. He still looked upon Timur as a tribal upstart. Now, Timur had long held plans to attack China and restore the full glory of the Mongol Empire. This was the excuse he was looking for. And at the age of 68, he massed his army again to invade China. Timur is risking everything on a treacherous winter expedition into enemy territory. But this is one war the great conqueror will never fight. The extreme conditions kill horses and men. Timur falls ill, and on a freezing night on the Kazakh steppe, he dies. It's such a shock that they keep his death a secret for a day and a night. And then the whole camp mourns, and his 200,000 strong army disperses, never to be united again. What if Timur had survived long enough for one more glorious campaign? He and his army would have crossed the mountains and invaded China. Victory would have achieved one of his greatest ambitions, the rebirth of a Mongol empire more than a century after Genghis Khan. With greater control of the Silk Road would have come more wealth and power and the prospect of an Islamic caliphate stretching all the way from Peking to Paris. That vision dies with Timur. And as news of his passing spreads through the empire, his other grand plan to found a glorious dynasty starts to unravel too. Timur has spent years planning for this moment, and now his chosen heir and successor steps forward, his grandson, Pir Muhammad. He must take control not only of a vast territory, but a volatile mix of people from different cultures and religions, from sultans to tribal warlords, from nomads to settled peoples. Yet the biggest threat comes from Timur's own family. From their regional strongholds across the empire, many of those overlooked during Timur's search for an heir are making their own plans for succession. 
When families do battle over the throne, the end result can be the end of empire. In the 14th century, Timur, the Central Asian warrior king, carves out a vast empire. But when he dies, it sends shockwaves across his lands. He leaves behind instructions for a grandson, Pir Muhammad, to become ruler. But other members of the family have no intention of respecting Timur's last wishes. One of them is Khalil Sultan, a grandson who'd won Timur's favor as a brave warrior, then lost it by making a scandalous marriage. He governs a territory to the east of Samarkand, and from there, Khalil Sultan sends out a message. Throughout the empire, coins had always carried the name of the ruler. But after Timur's death, Khalil Sultan has new coins minted. Now, this is one of them. But in an act of defiance, he leaves off the name of the new emperor, his cousin, Pir Muhammad. In the mosques in Khalil Sultan's province, there's more dissent. The new ruler's name is left out of official prayers. Instead, Khalil Sultan's name is used. Blood could explain the disrespect being shown to the new leader. Pir Muhammad lacks royal heritage, weakening his authority. Thanks to his mother Khan Zada, Khalil Sultan does have a royal pedigree. He likely believes that he was born to rule, and it doesn't take him long to stake his claim. Just months after Timur's death, Khalil Sultan and his army of feared mercenaries pushes west and seizes Timur's most precious legacy, the grand city of Samarkand. From his base in Kandahar in Afghanistan, Pir Muhammad can do nothing. But to have a chance of re-establishing his rule, he must win the capital back. Pir Muhammad marches his army 1,500 kilometers north to try and stop his treacherous cousin. Finally, Pir Muhammad reaches Samarkand, and he and Khalil Sultan do battle. But Khalil Sultan's too powerful, and he defeats his cousin. So he flees back to Kandahar to regroup, but doesn't get the chance. He's betrayed by one of his generals and is executed. Just two years into his reign, Timur's chosen successor is dead. The family war isn't over yet. Another contender for the empire still remains. Shuruk, Timur's youngest son, had been passed over for being too meek. But now he leaves his base in Iraq, Afghanistan, ready to prove that he's been underestimated. He marches his troops to the outskirts of the capital, where he realizes that Khalil Sultan has a stronger army. Rather than attack, he shrewdly makes a truce. An uneasy peace holds for five years. But in Samarkand, Khalil Sultan is running out of friends and money. Where his grandfather ran the capital astutely, inspiring loyalty in its inhabitants, Khalil Sultan sows resentment and unrest. From the poor to the powerful, he loses support and is spending money fast, much of it to pay his mercenary army. And for five years, Khalil Sultan spends the treasury. And in the end, he can't even pay his army and his generals run him out of town. Where does he go? To his uncle, Shuruk, where he thinks he's going to get safe haven. Instead, Shuruk removes him from power and takes his place as the new ruler. Shuruk has played a perfect game of succession. The son who Timur thought didn't have the strength of character to rule now sits on the imperial throne. Shuruk rules alongside his son, Ulug Beg who he installs in Samarkand. Victory comes at a cost. Timur's death and the power struggle that follows unleashes a wave of unrest across the empire. Shuruk and Ulug Beg are faced with rebellions in the provinces and a growing caste of troublemakers. 
neighbouring powers take advantage and start pushing back the empire's borders. Cracks in the empire are widening. But one part of Timur's legacy flourishes. Like his grandfather, Ulla Beg is a champion of the arts and sciences. He adds an observatory to the list of remarkable buildings in Samarkand and earns the nickname the Astronomer King. He builds schools and promotes education, strengthening a proud tradition that continues today. Outside the city walls, though, the unrest continues, and Ulla Beg, the great scholar, lacks the ruthlessness and military skill to deal with it. After his death in 1447, the decline accelerates. The northern reaches of the empire fall, reclaimed by tribes once crushed by Timur. Vast territories that he won in western Persia are lost too. The final blow to the empire comes a century after Timur's death. A loss he would have found particularly hard to take. His breathtaking capital, Samarkand, falls to Uzbek warlords and the empire's crowning glory finally slips from his family's grasp. Meanwhile, thousands of kilometers away, another continent flourishes. Here in Europe, the Renaissance is just reaching its peak. And a new breakthrough here will have serious consequences on the region that Timor once dominated. Timor had financed his empire by controlling the Silk Road, the overland trade route that carried goods east and west. Now European explorers discover a new sea route that bypasses Timor's homeland. The Silk Road goes into decline. And with it, so do the chances of a fearsome empire builder ever emerging from Central Asia again. Here lies Amir Timur, the last truly monumental ruler. His dark green sarcophagus was brought all the way from Mongolia. Above him is written Muhammad 40,000 times. Now it's said that each of his sons and grandsons possessed at least one of his great qualities. Jahangir was the great general. Sharuk had his cunning. Muhammad Sultan had his bravery in battle. But none of them possessed all his qualities. And when he died, his empire just faded away. It relied on him and him alone.